Hello class, let's review configurational isomers where we ask the question, do the two molecules, so let's just start, let's draw, let's draw a molecule here, okay. CH3. So we have two molecules here. Okay, we have two molecules here, molecule A and molecule B. And we want to know what is the relationship between these two. First thing we do, do they have the same molecular formulas? Yes, they do. Do they have the same or different connectivity? The connectivity is all the same. <clears throat> so, but now we know that they have the same molecular formulas, same connectivity. Okay, so they have, but they differ in the orientation of the molecules in space. So we know that they are stereoisomers of one another. But what kind of stereoisomers? Are they diastereomers or enantiomers? Now let's just rehash the definition of enantiomers. Enantiomers are two molecules right, that have the same molecular formula that they are mirror images of one another. You see how this is molecule A, molecule B. When you look at them, <clears throat> you could envision that there's a mirror there, and they are mirror images of one another. Even though they're two separate molecules, we are asking the question, what's the relationship between these two? So we see that there's a mirror plane, or a mirror image, sorry. But when you take this molecule and try to super, um, superimpose it, it's non-superimposable. It does not superimpose. So by definition, an enantiomer are molecules that are mirror images of one another that are not superimposable. So these two molecules right here are enantiomers of one another. Diastereomers, on the other hand, you have the same molecular formula, same connectivity, but what is different? The orientation in space. So if we had a molecule that looked like this versus this, we can see same connectivity, same molecular formula, but, the, <clears throat> but these groups are different in, are in different spatial orientations. So they're stereoisomers of one another because there's no free rotation around this double bond. But when we take it, <clears throat> does this molecule and this molecule, are they mirror images of one another? No, they're not. They're not mirror images because look at that. If I wanted to draw the mirror image of this molecule, what would that mirror image look like? Let's see here. It would look like that's what the mirror image of this one would look like. Do you see how this pink one and this blue one, they don't look alike? So between these two molecules, they are not mirror images of one another. And look, if I took this molecule, could I superimpose it on this one? No. So a, a definition, the definition for a diastereomer is when you're looking at one molecule and a second molecule, and you can see that they are not mirror images of one another, and they're not superimposable. So that makes them diastereomers. But what? But we have to have the same connectivity and the same molecular formula. That just follows the definitions from following this flow chart as you continue up that flow chart. Okay? So let's <coughs> take a look at diastereomers a little bit more. Now there's some really cool features here. And one feature of, amongst uh, enantiomers, when you look at two molecules that are enantiomers of one another, they're going to have the same physical properties. 
So they're going to have the same boiling point, the same melting point. And, and when you get into the lab, they'll have similar uh, or they'll have the same physical properties when you want to separate them by column chromatography. Diastereomers, on the other hand, have different, different physical properties. So they will have, when you compare these two molecules, they're going to have different boiling points, different melting points. Isn't that cool? So that's a key thing to remember when it comes to physical properties. Enantiomers have the same physical properties. Diastereomers have different physical properties. Now let's delve in and look at diastereomers a little bit more because they are very, very important. All right. Let's take a look at this molecule. When you look at it, how many stereocenters do you see? That one and that one. So we have two stereocenters. Now look at what that can actually do to us here. We could have it come out as a wedge for both of them like this. And when we figure out the R and S, we can see that we have an R here and an S there. But these stereocenters could have very well have been drawn like this, both as dashes. All right. And if they were drawn that way, then they would have been the opposite, like that. What's the relationship between these two molecules? If I call that molecule A and molecule B, what's the relationship between those two? If you look really, really hard, you will see that if you take this molecule here and flip it 180 degrees, you will see that they are mirror images of one another. So if I take molecule B and rotate it 180 degrees, so I'll call it B prime because I'm just taking molecule B and rotating it. It looks like it looks like this. That's a wedge. Do you see how B prime here and A, they're mirror images of one another? But if I try to take B or B prime and put it on top and superimpose you'll see that they're non-superimposable. So by definition, that makes these two compounds enantiomers of one another. Okay, so those are enantiomers. Right there. Now, but now we can have different combinations of these, uh, these stereocenters. I could make it this one a wedge, and this one a dash. So what's the stereo center here? Here, that would be a R, and that's an R, like that. But then I could have had a different, another combination, and I'll draw it below here. I could have had that one as a, a dash, and this one as a wedge. So what's that going to do for us? That's going to make that an S and that an S. Look at that. So what's the relationship between these two green ones? Hopefully you can see that they are mirror images of one another. So that makes them enantiomers. And let's give them letter designations. We'll say that's a molecule C and molecule D. And you can't see that. I'll put it right there. So molecule D. So now I could say, okay, those are enantiomers. Those are enantiomers. But what's the relationship between molecule A 
and molecule C. What's the relationship between those two? Well, what you have to do is draw the molecules out. So I'll draw molecule A here as shown like this. So that's molecule A. Then I'll draw molecule C. That's molecule C. Now what's the relationship between A and C? What I try to do is I try to take one of them, typically for some reason, it doesn't matter, but I always go to the right one. I take this right molecule and I flip it and rotate it to find a mirror image. So what I'm gonna do is take C and I'm just gonna flip it 180 degrees. And so when I flip it 180 degrees, it's gonna look like this. H and my methyl. So I just took that molecule and flipped it 180. So you saw how it went from a wedge to a dash and a wedge or a dash to a wedge, okay? Now I look, and why did I flip it 180 degrees? Because I wanted these substituents like a, a mirror image. And I see that the methyls are wedges and wedges, so those are mirroring, but that's a wedge, that's a dash. It's not mirror. So the whole molecule is not a mirror image. So when I look at A and C, I'm like, okay, they're not mirror images, so I, I have a little checkbox here. And I have the question, are they mirror images? And are they superimposable? Okay. And I see that they are not mirror images. So X, no. Are they superimposable? No. So that is a diastereomer by definition. A diastereomers are two molecules that are not mirror images and not superimposable. But when I do that same analysis for A and B, and I have my little check boxes here, mirror and superimposable, I look at A and B and I'm like, okay, they are mirror images, check. Are they superimposable? No. So that makes them enantiomers because that's the definition. Enantiomers are mirror images but are not superimposable. So what do you think is the relationship between B and C? B and C, what is the relationship? What do you think the relationship is between A and D? That is, those are questions I want you to figure out. And you can, we can talk about them during class. If, or you could show me what you got and we can discuss it, okay? But based off of the exercise that I just did, you should be able to figure that out. But look at the craziness of this. You have one molecule that I could have drawn, that we started off drawing like this. We started off with it looking like this, right? But we got four different stereoisomers. And this is the cool thing slash crazy thing, difficult thing, about organic chemistry and pharmacy and medical school is let's just say, this is all hypothetical, but the hypothetical principles that I'm sharing apply, is what if you wanted to design this molecule as a drug to cure an illness, but when you synthesize it, you make four isomers. And what if only isomer A cured the disease, and isomers B, C, and D kill you or have a negative effect like uh, birth defects. So you have to synthesize only this one. 
But if you ever have a trace amount of B, C, and D, then you're going to have negative effects. So this stereoisomers are very, very important in pharmacy and in the medical field is because some enantiomers, some diastereomers can kill you, cause side effects, or have no effect. And that's one of the challenges that we face when we're designing and synthesizing drugs, the different stereoisomers. Right. And the reason why it's, that's the case, why not all four of these could um, help with the disease is because in biology, you have what's called, or what you have molecules that are called enzymes. And enzymes, they recognize molecules based off of their shape, their three-dimensional shape. And the shape of A is going to be different than B, C, and D. And so the, molecule, the enzyme may only recognize that shape and not those. So biology and chemistry coming together is a really fun, fun concept. And you'll get more of that when you take biochemistry. So there's a formula that we can look, can use by looking at a molecule and using this formula, 2 to the n, that equal sign will tell us how many isomers we would expect. So when we would look at this molecule and we're like, how many isomers, stereoisomers can we have? Remember the answer? It was four. So when you look at a molecule, you identify how many stereocenters there are. And there's two. So two to the n equals four. Now this equation says it is the maximum amount. Okay, the maximum amount of stereoisomers. Running out of board space there. Now let's just tack on another stereo center. How many stereo center or stereoisomers would we expect? Two to the three is what? Eight. I'm not going to draw all eight of these out, but that would be a good exercise to look at that if you like. But the idea here is that this equation is going to tell you the maximum amount of stereoisomers. It can be less depending on the molecule. And the reason why it can be less than this number that you calculate is because you will find that some compounds are going to be meso. Okay. You have meso compounds, and we will talk about those later, but what that means, okay? But meso compounds is going to um, reduce this number. Okay. So we'll talk about meso compounds in a bit. But I just need you to understand that this formula gives you the maximum. It can be less. Another interesting thing about this is look how complex the chemistry can be. If you just have three stereocenters in your molecule, you can have eight different stereoisomers. And what if that molecule you're trying to make is only an active drug in one of those eight isomers. So it's going to be really, really difficult to synthesize just one of those isomers. So that is one problem. What if the other seven isomers hurt you? So you got to figure out, so all these problems. So this is one reason why pharmaceuticals are so expensive is because they have stereo centers. And it, it just complicates um, synthesizing these drugs. Now, organic chemists are getting better and better every day on figuring out how to 
make the isomer of interest and make that one only instead of a mixture of these. So, and we'll talk more about that. And if you want to learn more about um, synthesizing molecules with just one stereoisomer, then that's a graduate level concept, but it's a lot of fun. Okay. So let's see, what do we want to do next here? So let's take a molecule, okay, and make a statement here. That is cyclohexane, which I did not draw very well. Okay. <clears throat> what we can say is if a molecule Let's look at this one down here. If a molecule has one stereocenter, okay, it will always be chiral. We can make that bold statement. One stereocenter, it's chiral. But if you take a compound like here, our dice substituted cyclohexane ring, this molecule has two stereocenters. Make those look like stars. When it has two stereocenters, it is not a guarantee that the molecule is chiral. It may be chiral and it may not. All right. And what I'm going to discuss now is how can I tell? How can I tell when I look at a compound if it has two stereocenters if it's chiral or not? And the way that we do that is does it have a plane of symmetry or does it have a, a axis of rotation? Okay. So what we're going to look at is rotational symmetry. And we're going to look at plane of symmetry arguments here. So let's take a look at this molecule right here. And we'll draw our methyl group like this. We see that there are two stereocenters. So what is it? Is it achiral or not? Well, if you can find a plane of symmetry anywhere in the molecule, okay? or any plane, if you find any plane of symmetry in the molecule, the molecule will be achiral. So look at this. If I took this molecule and draw, drew a plane right through the middle, okay? so I'm taking a plane and going right through the molecule, what do we see? This half right there is the exact same half over there. Do you see how they match perfectly? If I took this plane of symmetry, I could sandwich the two halves together. So whenever you have a plane of symmetry found in your molecule, it's always going to be a chiral, even though there are two stereocenters. Plane of symmetry is always going to give you a achiral molecule. Now, what if we take a look at the isomer of that? What if we looked at a molecule that looked like this? All right. Now, when I'm looking here, is there a plane of symmetry right here? Is this half match this half exactly? No, it does not. This half has a dash and this half has a wedge. So there's no plane of symmetry here. Would there be a plane of symmetry right here? 
So let, let's get rid of this by here. All right. Is there a plane of symmetry? Well, that has all hydrogens, and then this side has the methyl group. So no, there's no plane of symmetry there. So there's no plane of symmetry. We do know those are stereo centers. But what does this guy have here? This molecule has a rotational symmetry. All right. Now, a rotational symmetry is if you can take a molecule and rotate it, and it looks exactly the same way as before you rotated it. All right. So, what I'm trying to say is if you look at this molecule here, all right, and what we're going to do is take this molecule and rotate it 180 degrees. All right. All right. What you have to do is you play this little trick in your mind. If I take this molecule, close my eyes, and rotate it 180 degrees, and then I open up my eyes, and if it looks exactly the same, then I know we have a rotational symmetry. So if I numbered the, if I could number these, okay, I'll, I'll put a one there and a two there. And I'm just putting these one and two here just to keep track of it. But when we open our eyes and look at the molecule, we do not see these ones and these twos, okay? It, they're not there. So if I take this molecule, close my eyes, flip it 180 degrees, what am I going to see? I'm going to see that. We'll see that's number one, that's number two. But remember, these ones and twos are just there to um, help us, guide us to not see where the carbons are going. But the principle is if you took this molecule, closed your eyes, and flipped it over, and then you saw this, do you see how there's no difference between the two? So that is a rotational symmetry there. Mm. Now this rotational symmetry here is very different than a plane of symmetry. This molecule here, yes, it has a rotational symmetry, but this molecule is still chiral. Right. It is still chiral. Okay, let's summarize this. And so the reason why I showed you these two uh, different types of symmetry is because they're different. So what we've learned is that if a molecule has a plane of symmetry, if you find any plane of symmetry, then the molecule is always going to be achiral. If you find a molecule has rotational symmetry, that is irrelevant if it's chiral or not. I just showed you that there's just a different form of symmetry going on here. Okay, so rotational symmetry does not tell you if it's chiral or not. It's irrelevant. Okay, just know that there is a thing called rotational symmetry. You'll be able, to, you'll be using that more in Orgo too. It's just to introduce the concept, okay? Now, there's a third point that you need to understand, and I'm going to read it to you. It says, a compound that lacks a plane of symmetry will most likely be chiral. Although there are rare exceptions, which can mostly be ignored for our purposes. Okay, so a compound that lacks the plane of symmetry more often than not is going to be uh, chiral. So if we take a look at this molecule right here, yes, it has rotational symmetry, but there is absolutely no plane of symmetry. And since there's no plane of symmetry, with a really high chance, we can say it's going to be chiral. 
There are exceptions, and we're just going to ignore those exceptions, okay? No, but so that's what you can basically, it's just all around this. If there's a plane of symmetry, a chiral, no plane of symmetry, chiral. More often than not. Okay. Sorry. Okay. We're not going to look at any exceptions there. So let's take this molecule here and figure out how many stereoisomers we would expect for this compound. So how do we proceed? Well, we have to find the stereo centers, and we see two right there. So two to the two equals four, and that is the maximum amount of stereoisomers we would detect. So let's start drawing them out. Okay. We could see one where we have a, da a wedge and a dash like that. We could have a second molecule where the OH here is a dash and now it's a wedge here. What's the relationship between these two? They're not superimposable, but they are mirror images. So, so those two would be enantiomers of one another. We could draw another one where both are wedges, right? And then we could then draw them both as dashes. So two to the two, or two to the n, two to the n is the formula, we see that we have four. One, two, three, four. So when we analyze these things, we can see these are enantiomers of one another. A and B are enantiomers. But then when we look at these two right here, look at what happens. What if I took this molecule right here and flipped it 180 degrees? Can you see that if I took this molecule and flipped it 180 degrees, what would it look like? it would match this guy. So in reality, this isomer and this isomer are not isomers of one another. They are identical molecules. So how many are we actually going to get? How many stereoisomers? We're only going to get three. Well, that is the max, but what is the actual number? That's going to be three stereoisomers. And the reason why do we only have three is because these two are identical. They're the same molecule. So we can just erase that guy. Now, when we take a look at this compound here, we can call that C. Compound C has a special name. It's called a meso compound. And meso compounds are molecules that have two, at least two stereocenters. And they have what? A plane of symmetry. So that makes the meso compound a chiral. So meso compounds, let's just say it one more time. What makes a meso compound meso? Well, it's a molecule with at least two stereocenters, and it has a plane of symmetry, which makes it a chiral. All right. So that's what you have to look out for when I give you a molecule and I say how many stereoisomers are present. You could say in a free response question, there is a maximum of four. But if I ask the question and I'm saying, how many? Draw them all. You're going to find out that there's only three in this particular example. So you've got to watch out for those meso compounds. What we have now is to take and look at molecules in a different way. We've looked at zigzag structures, we've looked at Newman, 
And now we have what's called a fissure projection. And fissure projections will take a molecule right here, the zigzag, and convert it into this right here. This is a fissure projection. And the way I keep fissure projections and Newman projections separate and distinct is a fissure projection does look like fish bones. That's what I'm visualizing. And fissure projections are typically used when you're looking at sugars. So this molecule right here is a sugar, and Dr. Fisher here just wanted a quicker and easier way to look at sugars this way, okay? So what we want to learn how to do is go from a zigzag to a fissure, and then a fissure to a zigzag. Now in order to do that, we need to take back up a little bit and understand what a fissure projection is. So if I have a molecule that looks like this, ethyl group, a hydrogen, and a CH3 group. We can see that it's also, that central carbon right there, it, it is a carbon, okay? So that's the fissure projection. What the Fisher projection is telling us, okay, is that we have that central carbon and the horizontal lines, okay, are representing wedges, H, O, H. And the vertical lines are representing dashes. That bit of information is super, super important. You have to remember these horizontal lines are wedges, okay? Now, why is that so important to understand? Is because look at this molecule here. What is the stereochemistry? Sorry, what is the um, configuration? Is it an R or an S? Well, when we look at it, we can prioritize things. That's going to be priority one, two, and three, and then priority four, right? So what would the, what is the configuration? Well, we go one, two, so we're going clockwise. One, two, three, so that would be an R, because we're going clockwise, right? Whoa, whoa, whoa! Four is the lowest priority, and it is what? A wedge. What have we always said? The lowest priority has to be facing in the back. It has to be a dash. And so what's the trick when we see the lowest priority as a wedge? We just take the opposite of what we calculated. So one, two, three clockwise, so that should be an R, but our lowest priority is a wedge, so we have to take the opposite. So that is a S. But you can do that in the Fisher projection. One, two, three, four. You can still do it, but you have to realize what the Fisher projection is. Those are wedges. So one, two, three, so R, but that's a wedge, so we have to take the opposite. So that would be a S. That is the important thing one of the important things to remember about Fisher projections is that's what it's showing us. So what I recommend you to do is you could take this molecule here and draw it, or I want you to go and make a model of it, just like this, okay? And when you make that model, you'll be able to see that Fisher projections can look like this, okay? You can actually take a molecule like this, okay, and you can grab it and spin it in such a way that you can make it look like this. So you can take that molecule and orient it in such a way to make it look like this, that you have two groups pointing out at you and then two groups pointing away from you. So you can make, take a very simple molecule like methane, and you can 
position up just like that. Highly encourage you to get a model system and do that. So now what we're going to do is now take these simple principles and apply it to a sugar, which is a little bit more complicated because it has what? It has six carbons there and it's going to have how many stereo centers? When we take a look at this molecule here, we see one, two, three, four. So we have four stereo centers. So if we number this zigzag, one, two, three, four, five, six. Whenever we have a zigzag, you're going to find the aldehyde or the carboxylic acid or a ketone. And those are typically found on either end. It doesn't matter which end, it's just you need to find the end where that uh, aldehyde or carboxylic acid, or just let's say carbonyl compound, carbonyl functional group. You're gonna find that and you're going to just number, hey, there's six carbons. And you're going to place that carbonyl at the very top of your Fisher projection. So that's gonna be one, two, three, four, five, and six. Now, this is very, very important because carbons two, three, four, and five, they are what? Stereocenters. And if you take this OH and this hydrogen and swap it, you have now made a different sugar. You cannot swap these. They're not interchangeable. That sugar is defined by the stereochemistry. And so when you come over to the Fisher projection, the stereochemistry here has to match, has to be perfectly matched. So how do you go from this zigzag and looking at carbon two, how do I know the OH is on my left and not the right? And then vice versa, when you look at carbon four, how do you know, okay? So now that's what we're going to do next is I'm going to show you the tricks that I use to figure out the stereochemistry on the Fisher projection. The first thing that you're going to do is I'm going to take this molecule and just redraw it by rotating it 90 degrees. All right. So just to save time, I'm going to pause the video, but rotate this 90 degrees and redraw it. So I've taken this molecule and I've just rotated it 90 degrees. And you see that if we number the carbons again, the stereochemistry has not changed. You can see in carbon two, it's a wedged hydroxyl, wedged hydroxyl. Okay, everything has to match. If I made a mistake, then you call me out on it. But double checking, carbon three is dashed OH. Okay, carbon four is dashed OH, carbon five is dashed OH. Okay, so everything matches. Now, how you do this, how do you figure out the answer here? Okay. Well, here's how you do it. Remember that these horizontal lines means that they're wedges, they're sticking out of this. And in order to see that we have to look at this vertical ver molecule here and approach it from the carbon that is pointed, okay? So do you see how carbon two is pointing this way, okay? So what we have to do is approach that point. So I've got to move my box here. So we need to approach it from this side. So I'm going to see my pointer finger. I'm basically going to take my eyeball and look at that carbon, carbon two. My eyeball is right here. I'm looking at that point. Now, when I'm looking at that point, I'm now going to use my handlebar analogy, and I see that the OH is a wedge, so that's sticking out of the board, so that's going to be my left hand. And then the hydrogen is a dash, so that's in the board, so that's in my right hand. And I'm going to grab them like handlebars, and then I'm going to ride my bike over, and then turn, and paste it right onto the board. You see how the hydrogen was in my right hand and the OH was in my left. They match. Now, if we do that same approach now with carbon three, now it would be a mistake to take my eyeball and look at carbon three this way. Why? 
because we're trying to find the point on that apex on that carbon. So that is not the approach that we have to take. We have to approach our eyeball from this direction. Now, looking at carbon three, I see that the OH is in the board, so in my left hand, and then the hydrogen is out of the board in my right hand. And then I take it, go to carbon three, boom, hydrogen in my right, OH in my left. And then it's just do it all over again. Let's take a look at carbon four. So we have a wedged hydrogen, so that's over here in my left hand. The dashed OH is in the board, so that's in my right hand. Take it, drive it over, boom, OH, hydrogen. And you just keep doing that, all right? So what, so that's how you go from zigzag to fissure. Now, you, I also want you to be able to go from the fissure to the zigzag. And so what you're going to do is just the exact opposite. Okay? The exact opposite of what I've just showed you. And so we'll get practice, we'll get some practice problems to look at that. What's another thing that we can do with Fisher projections here? We can look at these, look at those stereo centers and figure out if they're RRS, figure out the co configuration. Now we can use this as a reference here. Let's figure out the stereo center here at carbon two. So we have to prioritize things. So that's going to be, let's do a different color here. What's the, what's the configuration at carbon two? So that's one, I'm prioritizing in pink. So that would be three and four. Okay, so we're prioritizing things. So we're going one, two, three. So we're going in the counterclockwise direction. The lowest priority is a dash, so that's perfect. So one, two, three, counterclockwise. So that makes that a S. So that means this carbon has to be an S. It has to be. If we prioritize, we can prioritize right on the Fisher projection. That's one because we're looking at this carbon, that's two, and then all of this down here is three, and that would be priority four. Okay, now we look at it, we count it, one, two, three. We're going clockwise, one, two, three. So that's an R? No, hold on. What did we say about Fisher projections? Those are wedges. So we have to say, that, okay, yes, this is the numbering scheme, one, two, three, clockwise, but we have to remember that the H and OH are wedges, so that makes the lowest priority a wedge. So we just have to take the opposite. So that would be an S. Okay, so we keep doing that. And you, so you could do that for every single stereo center, and you should be able to do that. Okay, let's see, what time do we have here? Let's see, we have a few moments. Well, class, I think that's gonna be a good stopping point. So let me just give you some words of advice here. Everything that we're learning in these, this chapter here is very visual. And it can be difficult for some people to see it in their head. And so what you can do is get your model kit, draw, build these molecules, and make those connections to what the molecule looks like on a, on a board or a piece of paper to what it actually looks like in three dimensions. And building those models takes time, but I promise you the time that you invest in building these models will pay out handsome rewards. Like good, good stuff can come from it. Um, 
And then, as always, if you ever need help, don't wait till the last minute. These concepts are very difficult to cram in right before an exam. You have to get help well in advance. Okay? So I'll leave you with that. If you need any help, reach out to the TAs, reach out to me. We're more than happy to.